does it show up now? No, it keeps saying the host has stopped it. Interesting. Um, not sure what's going on. All right. Thank you, Nick. Uh, I am Chris Larson, state senator for the seventh Senate district. Um, we do have uh, with us who will also do their own introductions, Representative uh, Christine Sinicki from the 20th and Jonathan Brassa from the 19th, as well as an interpreter. Um, we're going to do our best to make sure we're, we're giving our uh, interpreters a, a break. So if there's a pause in between as that switches out, uh, that's, that's why. Um, and so if there are questions, as Nick said, throw those up in the chat. Um, I will start off by saying, uh, as with all the other virtual town halls that we've done, uh, we took the questions in advance just to, to make things move a little bit more with ease. Um, as always, you can, you can message uh, my office or any of the representatives' offices uh, with questions. Uh, email for my office is best or phone calls are best uh, to be able to get a prompt response. Um, and I know folks use use every other method, pay Facebook, Twitter, um, et cetera, but those are the usually the, the fastest ways. So we're going to try and uh, keep moving along here to try and get to as many questions as we as we can. Um, I will say on the onset that um, uh, we, I, we did extend an invitation to the, uh, the representative from the 21st uh, to also join us in answering some of the questions, but that was not uh, responded to, unfortunately. Um, so. Um, like I said, represent the 7th Senate District, which if you are here, you're probably in it. Starts all the way up at UW-Milwaukee, uh, east side of Milwaukee, River West, uh, going through downtown, the east part of downtown, 3rd Ward, um, Bayview, and then uh, further down St. Francis, Cudahy, South Milwaukee, and Oak Creek with a little bit of Franklin, uh, or the best parts of Franklin, uh, for those of you that are there. Um, is the area I represent. And we are, just to give a broad view, we are in session now, um, although no bills have passed um, or nothing has passed. And so that marks uh, a long drought where if you're keeping score at home, we are now on 292 days uh, since the last time something has passed the legislature, uh, passed both houses and been signed by the governor um, or even through the joint resolution, which we'll get to um, something that's been enacted uh, and carried forward. So that uh, that gives us the uh, illustrious distinction of being the least active full-time legislature in the entire country. Uh, and of course that overlaps with the historic uh, pandemic uh, and employment and everything that's gone with it. So we'll talk about um, how we've been continuing to try and push, but even as we are now in session, it has not gotten to the point where any bills have passed yet. So, um, so with that, I'll, uh, I'll pass the torch uh, to Representative Sinicki looks looks more ready <laughs> at the moment. Thank you, Senator Larson. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm glad you could join us. I am State Representative Chris Sinicki, and I represent the middle part of Senator Larson's district. I represent uh, the Bayview area, uh, the, the southern part of the Bayview area, going out west towards the airport, out to about 27th Street, 35th Street along the city limits, and also St. Francis and Cudahy. Um, I don't have much to add about what's going on in Madison because there's not a whole lot going on, which in my opinion right now is probably a good thing given the makeup of our legislature. Um, you know, we are scheduled to be on the floor tomorrow to, to vote to repeal the mask mandate, which I assure you, I am not voting to repeal the mask mandate. Um, we, we will have two weeks uh, before the Senate takes that up. So I'm pretty sure at some point in this town hall, we are going to ask you to uh, start calling uh, your legislators or have your friends and, and family call Republican legislators if you support the, the mask mandate. So I guess I am going to turn it over to Representative Rostov. Hey, thanks. Uh, and thanks, Senator Larson. Thanks, Representative Snicky. Uh, thanks to our uh, wonderful interpreters and the staff who helped set this up. And I see that we have my old intern and uh, my buddy uh, Tamara uh, doing our um, CDI interpreting. So I just want to say uh, thanks for our great staff and uh, our great Terps and uh, thanks to everyone for joining us. I um, 
am uh, State Representative Jonathan Grostoff from the 19th District. So we've got the east side of my district, downtown Bayview, River West. Well, Bayview up until Oklahoma, and then it goes south to represent Snicky's area um, past Oklahoma. And, um, you know, I just uh, really appreciate um, everyone showing up for this. Obviously, the, um, you know, better to do it in person, but uh, with COVID, we're, we're doing it virtually, so we appreciate your patience on that. And, um, you know, we have the vaccines rolling out. We have now a competent administration um, as far as logistics in the White House. And so I uh, am hopeful that, you know, we can start meeting face-to-face soon-ish and that, uh, you know, we'll be able to do that again. So I really do enjoy these, but, um, but this is how it is for now. So thanks for participating. And I want to echo my colleagues' sentiments. Uh, and the reason why it's been 292 days is because the Republicans control the legislature and they have decided that they are not going to do anything with this. And this isn't, you know, about, uh, you know, bashing anyone, but this is stating facts. And the fact is we should have been meeting every single month when the pandemic hit, we should be giving updates. There should have been, you know, resources that needed to go here or there adjusted and, and at least meeting every month to make sure that we're meeting the needs of our, um, of our districts and of the state, but um, unfortunately, our colleagues refused to do anything. And even when the governor used the procedural opportunity he has for an extra, for sort of an emergency situation, if there's something out of the ordinary, um, and and he has the ability to basically call the legislature back into session um, for for unique situations, he did that and was gaveled out immediately within seconds or you know a minute, basically. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, that's a situation we find ourselves in. And we do come back now to meet why for a joint resolution, taking away masks in the middle of a pandemic when we're, have three new strands being introduced that are gonna mutate the virus, potentially make things much worse. And when we have a vaccine and now the vaccine rollout is getting moving. So there's a light at the end of the tunnel and if we can take care of each other and do what we need to do as a state to keep people safe and keep businesses safe and you know keep things moving along, we can get out of this much quicker. But instead of any relief, instead of any action, instead of the bipartisan bill that the Senate Republicans and the governor organized, because of the terrible leadership in charge of the uh, Republican Assembly and Senate right now, we now find ourselves talking about a ludicrous joint resolution that uh, is completely irresponsible and and uh, and that's and and that's what, what's happening instead of governing in Wisconsin that's why and it's another symptom of gerrymandering so um, yeah and uh, so the I don't know if we're doing questions I still have my chat up but the, the, the other representative Rodriguez who's joined uh, she has the suburbs to the south of to kind of the south and west areas. Um, so the other, you know, so th th that's um, that's her district. Uh, she did not join us, um, and she is of the other party. But of course, she's still in the Senate district and welcome to participate in the town hall. I don't know if she has come to one of them yet, but the senator could answer that. I don't believe so. She's gone to one we did in, in person at once uh, oh, okay. a while back. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's happened before. hasn't happened hasn't happened recently, but we continue to to try and reach out. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Anyways, the um, just to put a to uh, a finer point because everyone likes the latest and what's new with the news. So, uh, as my as as the representatives alluded to, the assembly is coming in tomorrow at ten a.m. Um, so hopefully both of both of them are driving safe to get through uh, to get there uh, safely as the snowstorm is coming in. Um, and what's interesting is the things that they're taking up are both were, were versions of things that were already taken up uh, in the Senate. Um, but because both of them are announced to be different, uh, both of those things have no chance of becoming law over the next two weeks until the Senate returns. And one of them is a, the joint resolution which would extinguish the emergency um, requirement for mask wearing in the state of Wisconsin. And so because uh, an emergency declaration can be extinguished through a joint resolution, um, that does not go to the governor. And I think a lot of people have this false sense of, of, uh, of hope 
that well anything that these guys pass there's a, there's you know they may pass whatever they want but this goes to the governor and that'll get vetoed the joint resolution is not vetoed uh, and so it would basically end the emergency declaration that allows for the mask requirement in the state of Wisconsin. Um, but what folks have been, they've been tripping on is last six days ago, sorry, uh, eight days ago, the Senate voted on this. But then seven days ago, last Wednesday, a report came out that said that $49 million would be lost in the state of Wisconsin for those receiving food share in supplemental service from the, the federal government. And 49, so, a month, 49 million a month. Right, right, 49 million every single month. And that goes directly to individuals uh, in this enhanced benefit. And so there has to be an emergency declaration. And, uh, and by the way, that came, that was passed by the federal government at a time where there was split control of the legislature there and a Republican governor, Donald Trump. Um, and so by going and saying that there's no emergency, the Republicans are actually putting themselves further to the right of Donald Trump and national Republicans in saying that there is no uh, emergency happening. Uh, they very specifically in this national legislation said that there had to be an emergency declaration to receive these additional benefits. So that's that was the stall. So Thursday morning came um, and they decided that they weren't they were going to take a closer look at it. And now tomorrow we'll see what what they put forward and what they try and do. But it's a different version of what passed the uh, Senate. And so uh, it'll be another two weeks before the Senate comes in. Um, so just to give you a kind of a timeline. So what does that mean? We'll see what happens tomorrow through the assembly and then all eyes are on the Senate. There is no there is no statement I've heard from the Senate Republican leadership that says they're on board with what Republicans in the assembly are doing. That has been true almost all throughout the last two weeks. So that is something that's important to watch is that basically it's a staring contest between the Senate Republicans and the assembly Republicans and all of us and our, our, live, our lives kind of hang in the balance. Um, and oh, by the way, a majority of Wisconsinites support the mask requirement. It's the best way to, uh, to prevent the spread of the, uh, the virus, including the new variants that are coming through. Um, so that's the, 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 the latest. Did I miss anything? Um, anything Sarah, else for tomorrow? I'm not tomorrow, but did you want to talk briefly about AB1, which is the COVID relief bill that they're play, playing ping pong with right now? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can. Go ahead. You're taking it out. Sure. <laughs> like, I'll, I could, um, I don't have it in front of me, so I'm not sure exactly what's in there. But um, as both Senator Larson and Representative Broskoff said, um, how many days since we've passed the COVID relief bill? Close to 300 now? It was back in yeah, April. Since April 15th. Yeah. It was, it was back in April, we passed the first COVID relief bill. We have not been in session to take up COVID, uh, COVID relief bill since then. Um, there was, there's been a bill introduced, AB1, um, by the Republicans. And um, the one that came out of the assembly, it was sent to the Senate, was not a good bill. Uh, not a good bill at all, pretty much. Um, I mean, there was immunity for business owners. It was, it was just, it was, it was not what Wisconsin needed. What Wisconsin needs is a COVID relief bill that is going to help support our small businesses and, uh, and support our working families who are struggling so bad. So when this bill went over to the Senate, the Senate decided uh, that they were gonna be the sane ones in this. <laughs> and actually fixed it. Um, now it is back in the assembly. And so we're kind of playing ping pong with this bill that is probably right now in most of our minds in uh, one of the most important things we can do. So, right. um, you know, I hopefully within right. the and next hope weeks we'll have something. Right, and this is and this allows for um, more more funds to be able to flow through to the state. This um, um, and the the hang up is essentially they want to force school boards to take a vote every two weeks whether they should stay open or not. Uh, they also want to require a heightened threshold of about uh, schools staying open or not, and they also want to um, uh, intercept a hundred million dollars before it's spent in the state. They basically saying we would we want to actually decide how that's going to be spent and have a say in it uh, on a committee which is tilted 75% Republican 25% Democrat by the way. Um, so these are these are the holdups and yeah.
They also want to control the rollout of the vaccine. Right. So let's right. not forget it, that. Yeah, I thought that was in a separate bill, but is that an AB one? No, that's that's an AB one, I believe. Oh wow, that, that was yeah. uh, there was a portion of that that was added in the yeah. uh, Second Amendment, which bans yes. um, bit private businesses from requiring vaccinations of their yeah. workforce. Right, right. Yeah, that's still in there. So, um, so yeah, that's that's AB one, and so that that continues to wait and that continues to bounce around. So that'll be uh, whatever. We'll see what happens tomorrow, and then watch to see what what and what uh, uh, Senate Republicans say, and and you know watch our our Facebooks and and official Twitter uh, accounts for for information. We're trying to pass that on about what's going on. So and folks have been great. Uh, we put out uh, my office coordinated a mask petition earlier in the summer. Uh, preceding the mask announcement. So thank you to everybody who signed on to that. And then of course, since it's been under threat, we've been sending emails to make sure folks are updated and people have been responding um, like gangbusters. It's been great. So, uh, and my, our colleagues recognize that. Of the 46 different groups that have registered on the mask requirement, 100% have registered in opposition to repealing it. So this is something where there is, there is a, uh, a clear consensus that this is this is safer. Um, oh, and it's now 60, we broke 60. So thank you for the update, uh, Justin Blinsky from my office. Um, okay, so that's the, the lay of the land. The other thing to kind of keep an eye on uh, is if, if you're marking your calendars is February 16th um, is also the day we might be back in the Senate, but it's also the presentation of the state budget. Uh, so this is uh, the opening salvo of the governor. And so we're already starting to see it today. There was an announcement that Governor Evers is going to have some uh, control over prescription costs. Expect to see that over the next 13 days. Um, little things leaking out about what the governor is planning on introducing in his budget. Um, so that typically happens. The budget will be released then on Tuesday, February 16th. Um, and then from there, um, there's a breakdown, usually takes a week or so, we get a, uh, an idea of exactly what's all in this budget. Uh, then it goes to the Joint Finance Committee where they go through piece by piece. There'll be uh, hearings. Um, I would bet, and um, my colleagues can correct me, I would bet they're probably gonna do in person. Maybe they'll do virtual. The Senate has allowed for virtual things over the last few months, the, the assembly, not so much, um, but so keep an eye on on that. Um, and then it goes before uh, both houses and then it has to pass by uh, beginning of July or end of June uh, for the next biennium. And that's the budget that controls the next, the next two years um, of dollars. So uh, there should be some good things in there, but then of course with a gerrymandered Republican majority, uh, they, get a, they get a swing at it. Um, and we'll see what ends up happening. The last thing that to note, um, because we only do this every two years and, and uh, it's worth reminding, is um, if the budget doesn't pass, it just we just have a continuing uh, continuation of the last budget. So it's not like the federal government where the, the state would then shut down. So if it doesn't pass by the, the deadline of uh, July 1st, we would just kind of continue. But uh, they were able to pass it before in time two years ago, um, which is good. So, so there you go. So February 16th is the, the next day to watch for the uh, uh, what's happening in the Senate, what's happening with the, uh, the budget introduction. So with that, uh, I will re, oh, and click our staff, I got all the info. And February 16th is also spring primary election. Uh, and so encourage you to vote. Absentee voting has already opened up. If you need to re-register to get an absentee ballot, you can do that. We're not gonna talk about who to vote for on this, but. Uh, there is nonpartisan elections happening February 16th for the primary and April 6th for the general. Um, In-person voting is open in Milwaukee and uh, maybe in other locations as well. So uh, check that out. Um, it's also Mardi Gras too. So an extra reason to, to celebrate February 16th. All right, the moving directly into the questions. Um, and I did see a couple of the questions uh, somebody posting in there. Um, if you want, uh, we, we probably won't be able to get to them, but if you want to add your email or direct message and email to us, that'll then we can respond. But it's probably easiest to respond to or send an email to our office so we can respond uh, that way. We'll try and get to those if we if we have time at the end, though. Um, so jumping into the questions, COVID. 
a lot of the questions about COVID. Oh, and just to give kind of an outline so people have an idea of the flow of everything. Uh, we did introductions. We're going to go questions and discussion. And then at the end, um, I'm, if we have time, I'm going to give an update on the survey results that my office did over the last month about pe where people stand in the opening session. Um, and then we're going to go to closing remarks. So that's so diving in, a first question, uh, what is the timetable of the vaccine rollout and, rollout and why are certain individuals, those under 65 particularly, receiving it before some more at-risk individuals? And this, this question was asked a lot and we get it asked a lot directly and on the phone and email, et cetera. Uh, basically, the current phase of vaccinations is ongoing, uh, which includes frontline healthcare personnel, uh, for those that haven't gotten it yet, or gotten the second vaccination, residents in skilled nursing and long-term care facilities, fire and police personnel, correctional staff, and all adults age 65 and older. Next phase is scheduled to begin March 1st, uh, depending on available supply, and will include teachers, bus drivers, grocery workers, and others in the food supply chain, childcare staff, Medicaid long-term care enrollees and residents in congregate living facilities, including prisons. Uh, for info, you can find it dhs.wisconsin.gov um, slash COVID-19. My staff will post that in the chat so you can click on that. Uh, some individuals who are not in eligible groups have been vaccinated at the discretion of the vaccination provider. Uh, sometimes it's to prevent spoiling of an open batch after they open it. Each of these vials actually has uh, enough um, uh, vaccine for, uh, I think like seven or eight people. And so if they don't have seven or eight people that are in the first priority group, uh, they open it up to others so that it's not spoiling. So as many people are getting it as possible. Um, it is out of the hands of the state to determine exactly who is getting the doses so long as the provider can provide reasonable justification for their decision making. Uh, the groups chosen to receive the vaccine in the next two phases have been determined by the SDMAC committee and DHS, uh, but future rounds may be determined in coordination with the Biden administration, which has taken a more active role than the previous administration. That's understatement of the year. Um, the other big piece about that is Wisconsin has not received its full allocations of vaccines, so it's been really hard to be able to budget and plan those things out. Um, and so that's something they're, um, they're, we're hoping to get uh, uh, changed and fixed. Um, and so things get more on track. There's also a cover story in the Journal Sentinel about that, that, that gives folks an update. Uh, where can you register to get the vaccine? There's currently not a statewide portal to register to be vaccinated in Wisconsin, but literally today, uh, local health departments, including Milwaukee, uh, set up registration. And so that link is milwaukee.gov slash COVID vax, um, which we'll post in the chat. Um, and clicking register now. If you are in a different community, please contact your local health department for information. Uh, state of Wisconsin is set to roll out a statewide portal the week of February 15th. So again, that's uh, 12 days from now. Uh, that's in partner with partnership with Microsoft and will allow currently eligible individuals to make an appointment directly and others to put their name on a wait list. If you're eligible and you don't wanna wait that long, we encourage you to contact your direct care provider um, to make an appointment if you're in that eligible position. Um, that's been the instructions for everybody, 65 and older, um, and for others uh, to be able to uh, get vaccinated. Um, all right, is that, I'm just making sure, because it looks like I have a bunch of these, or am I, uh, is Jonathan, Representative Brostoff and Representative Sinecki jumping in on some of these? Otherwise, I can keep, so no, I keep I going. Yep, you you're going to be covering all of COVID, Senator. Covering all of COVID. All right. Hope you like the sound of my voice. <laughs> I'm going to keep going on COVID. Um, okay. So uh, the next question, where can I find more statistics about COVID? Um, always best, as much as there's a lot of misinformation out there on the web, um, it's best to go directly to the source, encourage you to do that. And there's ways to sign up for direct uh, direct information. So the websites you wanna to go to for the state is DHS and nationally it's the CDC. Those are the best sites for accurate up-to-date uh, guidance and statistics. Uh, keep in mind that DHS will have more up-to-date information about Wisconsin than the CDC. Um, and your local health department may have more up-to-date information than DHS. So all these sources should sync up 
um, within a few days of one another. So they're updating their, their info live. So that's the best place to be able to, to, to check the local statistics, which I think every all of us are doing. Um, next question. Why is there not more readily available testing within walking distance? Short answer is money. Um, staffing, it, all of this takes funds. And part of the big holdup right now is, is um, this COVID relief bill that's happening nationally um, would provide for uh, additional funds to be able to hire direct staff. So the short answer is money. Um, staffing, supplying, maintaining testing facilities, all of that costs uh, money. The state only has so much to work with, uh, so they have to decide how best to prioritize locations to get the most bang for their buck. Um, there are also sites funded by local governments and some that are entirely privately funded. Uh, for a list, you can visit uh, dhs.wisconsin.gov slash community COVID-19 slash community slash testing. I'll post that in the chat. Um, you may also be eligible to receive an at-home testing kit as supplies uh, allow. Um, so a lot of a lot of the future flow of this is going to depend on this national bill passing and being able to help make this happen. Um, all right, two more from me, and then we're moving on to everybody. Uh, next question, what is the status of the statewide mask mandate? And would you do you support one? Oh, man, I think we covered that one. Um, and yes, I support the statewide mandate. Um, so yeah, that's a good one, quick one. Next question, can we expect additional monetary support for both businesses and individuals from the state or federal government? It's a very good chance, good question. A uh, very good chance that some of the new relief will be passed at the federal level. All eyes are on that. There's the, the battle between the $1.9 trillion bill, which has a lot in it, including raises, a raise in the minimum wage, which has uh, additional checks of $1,400 per individual um, for those making more than, um, uh, I think less than $75,000. And then of course, direct funds to local governments to fund police, fire, paramedics, teachers, um, and then of course, to be able to move the vaccine. Um, so there's a very good chance that that version is gonna move through. So we'll see uh, that has to pass both, both houses. Uh, it's not yet clear what the deal will ultimately look like, but direct cash payments to individuals and small businesses are, um, are likely, we'll say that it's likely. Uh, as far as from the state government, the state has not passed anything that hasn't flowed through the federal or from the federal government. Um, that is a, a fight that I would hope we would have soon, especially with the, the budget and especially with um, Republicans bragging that we have a structural $1 billion surplus um, based, and that's basically saying that the projections, if everything holds over the next five months between now and June 30th, uh, spent, uh, um, we will have an extra $1 billion at the end of that. So it makes sense to say, okay, at a time where people are, are hurting, um, we should make sure that funds are going to them. Or to put it another way, if the rain, and that and the rainy day fund is at a, still at an all time high. Um, and so if you are putting on waiters to get in your basement because it's pouring rain, it makes sense to spend out of the rainy day fund. That has not happened yet. Um, so that, that should, should be the next uh, fight. But no, there has not been funds direct from the state that haven't required, um, that haven't started at the federal level. So that's all of, uh, all of the COVID questions um, that we've got. Uh, and we'll dive into the next one and I'll tee it up uh, for, I kicked it up to, Representative Stinky last time. I'll kick it off to uh, Representative Rostov to go to elections and voting. Sure. So the next question we have uh, from our audience is, what will you do to inspire confidence in future elections as opposed to the disputed uh, 2020 election? Um, so first off, I just want to clarify something in the premise of that question. The, 2020 election was not disputed. In fact, multiple experts, it, it, it was over and over and over in Wisconsin, as well as across the country, shown to be one of the most secure elections of all time. And um, there, there were no significant issues with the 2020 election. Unfortunately, it was a lie that was spread and repeated over and over and over. 
and that has gained some ground among certain circles as well as in some kind of um, more elaborate conspiracy theory groups. But um, it's, uh, you know, kind of unfortunately one of the, become one of the threats to our democracy because uh, those who, you know, would continue to lie about it and diminish the faith in it are, um, you know, pushing some very, very dangerous rhetoric as we saw explode on January 6th when we had a bunch of domestic terrorists come attack um, the, the White House, or excuse me, the Capitol. And, um, you know, the, 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 so first of all, again, it, it was not in dispute. It, it was lied about, and those are two very different things. The question is why was it lied about? This wasn't just the recent administration. This has been going on for years. Well, why do they lie about the elections? Because there's a group of people who are power hungry legislators and lawmakers and politicians that have decided that instead of normally in a democratic republic or a representative democracy, you would want to have legislation that the majority of your constituents, the majority of people want. Things, you know, a contemporary example could be uh, marijuana legalization, which is extremely popular, passed a bunch of referendums in Wisconsin. And, you know, we're not, you know, there's been no movement on that in years, and it doesn't look like it's going to pass this year. Well, why not just introduce legislation as popular? Well, because there's a group of people who, instead of in the competing ideas marketplace, want to introduce ideas that uh, the majority of people would want and that they're going to get, therefore, reelected for, they're taking the opposite approach, which is to freeze as many people out as possible. And part of that is by sowing the seeds of doubt by lying, by continuing this. And I'll tell you, for example, our colleague, Representative Tussler, had this committee hearing where he had this shock jock, you know, radio guy on there, this right-wing extremist, you know, open up the committee hearing. He didn't have any of the uh, experts testify who were there, didn't have the committee clerks testify, but he had all these people making all these wild accusations about how there might, could have been something this, something that. And, None of it was verified. None of it was, you know, under oath. It was all just silly, you know, conspiracy theories. The people who are going there are into all this other stuff, and some are into all this QAnon, whatever. And the and and also it was interesting at that committee. The Democratic members of that committee, including the ranking member, kept getting cut off or, or were repeatedly muted, not allowed to ask follow up questions. But Regardless of all that, the reason for the meeting wasn't because Tussler actually believes any of this stuff. I don't think he does or any of the Republicans do. I think it's more so because they want to plant the seeds for getting rid of things like same day registration. Um, they want to lower the amount of hours that polls in certain areas like Milwaukee can be open. They've tried that in sessions past. They want, you know, they don't want, they want to get rid of automatic voter registration nationally and they don't want to come in here. And again, this is because their path to power is more about shutting certain people out of the process than allowing everyone to come in and introducing popular ideas that the majority of people want. So um, what will I do to inspire confidence in our electoral system? Continue introducing good governance legislation, continue working towards um, restoring the, uh, the reputation Wisconsin has had uh, as far as governing and governance um, nationally, as far as clean government. And um, I'll lead by example myself as an elected official, but, um, but I will not just accept the false premise that this was a, you know, quote unquote, contested dispute elections. It wasn't. Um, every single uh, lawsuit, pretty much every expert, you know, it's, it's you know, that's just silliness. Um, and I, and I'm not going to have it. So there you go. Um, next question is, do you support redrawing of gerrymandered maps? Wait, got it then. Oh, Can sorry. Stick to the election part once, because I do want to add something to... Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. And I see um, Chris is up next. Well. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, when you talk about election fraud in Wisconsin, it's actually very, very minute. And if they're caught, and they usually are, it is prosecuted. Uh, on a very bipartisan basis. Uh, it's, it's happened, you know, on, on both sides. As far as this past election, this was probably the closely, most closely monitored election, at least in my lifetime. It was, it was watched by 
everybody. Um, and when would I start when people, you know, when people were talking about, oh, what what about that big bag of, of votes that they found at three o'clock in the morning that suddenly, you know, they had to count? Well, this when this election was being, you know, when we're ramping up for it for the months ahead of it, we all knew that there was going to be a uh, huge, huge increase in absentee voting. In fact, my polling place, which is Fernwood, I believe when I talked to the, the chief inspector over there, like the next day, there were 90 people that voted in person in that building. And this is one of the highest voter turnout areas in the city of Milwaukee. 90 people voted in person. So this, this the counting of these ballots worked out exactly as the, ex the experts said it would long before election night. They knew that the in-person voter uh, ballots will be counted first. They had to be counted first. And when those were done, they would start counting the in-person or the mail-in ballots. So there was no fraud there. It, would, it, was, it happened exactly as it was supposed to happen. Um, and um, I have no concern with our elections here in Wisconsin. All right, it looks like uh, Senator Larson is going to take on the next question. Yeah, um, the next question, do you support the redraw, as, as Jonathan said, uh, do you support the redrawing of gerrymandered maps? Yes, and actually we have to do it regardless. Um, so we are in a census year right now um, that just finished up. And so it's going through the process of um, moving through, which we'll talk about. Actually, I'll, I'll um, yeah, that's kind of covered in more in the next question. But yes, we should redraw gerrymandered maps and they should not be gerrymandered. Uh, Wisconsin deserves maps that are truly representatives of the community where uh, voters are choosing their elected officials and not the elected officials choosing their voters, right? And this is something where more and more the public has understood. This is like, uh, this has been happening for way too long. It ends up making a, a rigged system um, that makes it that much harder to hold people accountable um and so yes they should be and and this isn't just something i believe and i know the representatives believe but frankly 82 percent of um, folks in the state of wisconsin have either uh directly voted or been part of a uh, or have had their local legislative branch vote uh in favor of having nonpartisan redistricting um, and so this is something where everybody wants this. They recognize that the, 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 the game is tilted against them. Um, and stay tuned, I'm actually working with a UWM professor uh, to try and, and, and demonstrate this. This guy came up with a game to demonstrate how rigged maps hurt uh, communities and, and uh, what that actually looks like. So stay tuned, we're, we're gonna try and do something uh, on that uh, once, once he and I touch base. Um, so rolling into the next, the next question, uh, what is the process of the process for the creation of and when can the people expect redrawn maps from the citizens redistricting uh, committee? Um, okay, and this one, this one looks like it's mine too. Okay, people's map. The, there's a people's map commission that the governor put together and appointed. Uh, um, all of the appointments were not of politicians or people who have served in public office, they were of the public. After the US Census data is released, the commission will use the apportionment data uh, and graphic information system mapping technology to draw fair maps based on the population distribution and the principles of redistricting. Uh, the commission will decide the exact process for drawing the maps, which could include engaging mathematics and software experts to help produce the final maps based on the commission's directives input and priorities. When's that gonna happen? Um, we'll see what's happening with the Census Bureau. There's a lot of stuff was delayed due to COVID. That's one of them, um, but uh, the timeline right now is end of July. Uh, they, the US Census Bureau should release Wisconsin's co data collected in the 2020 Census. Uh, and the commission will begin drafting a set of maps to the legislature. Uh, legislature will then choose to accept the people's maps or ignore the people's nonpartisan maps to draft their own. 
Um, and so we will see, but the, the, the things to watch for is July and uh, keep an eye on what's happening nationally with the census. Um, of course, there's the, the, the possibility that, um, uh, I'm just making sure that I'm not stealing someone else's question. Okay, there is a chance that the Republicans might not accept fair maps. Shocking, I know. Um, if that happens, this would go back and forth between the legislature and the governor. This is like a bill that needs to pass, right? It, it is a bill that needs to pass. And so if the if there is a difference, it would go before the courts. And so then the battle would be which jurisdiction it goes to. Uh, Republicans have already tried to push that the state Supreme Court would be able to grab uh, to, to grab it, um, which is tilted right now in Republicans' favor. Um, precedent says that this goes to federal courts. And so that that would end up being a little bit more fair. And if that happens, they may end up having to draw the maps. The last time that happened was 2000, when Chris Sinicki was a new state rep running for re-election as a sophomore. Um, not to put you on the spot, but that as, as her and I were talking, she let me know that, that those maps came out right before signatures were due. Uh, and so it was, it was, uh, if we put that, uh, that timeline and overlaid it with ours, that would mean we wouldn't know the maps until, uh, May, no, April, April of 2022. So we shall see with bated breath, but the ball is rolling with a nonpartisan redistricting commission. So, um, so there you go. Kicking it to Jonathan Brastov next. So next question is, how will the Biden presidency alter Wisconsin politics? Well, um, I think that there's going to be a lot of shift. Um, I'm not going to speak too much to the campaign side of politics, because that's not really appropriate for this forum in this context. So I'm going to speak more on the policy side of politics. but. Um, Basically, and I hope that's what the intention of the person asking was, but basically uh, it's, it's going to have huge shifts. Uh, we're already seeing it. I mean, first off, having, a, having an administration that's competent and that is interested in you know, spending their time helping people is a strict upgrade and it's a huge deal. Um, and that's, the, and, and you're already seeing a bunch of things. For example, um, just the logistics of the vaccine rollout in a couple of days is being handled that better than basically the last year of the previous administration. Um, not to mention state aid reimbursement for uh, things like that they should have been, you know, for masks. So, for example, under the previous administration, all these PPE equipments and all this other medical supplies where there was an artificial um, inflation that was forced uh, you know, on, on the states through this strange system of competition that was created by the White House instead of what they, you know, instead of a much more appropriate action to take. Um, and so, so instead of making, instead of jacking the prices up, what's happening now is states are actually getting reimbursed for that and getting much needed aid, which is also really important because next cycle, states, counties, and municipalities across the country are going to be hurt uh, significantly because the revenues are going to be down because the, the, there's not as much um, money recirculating through their economies because, you know, there's, you know, we, you know we're not having Summerfest and, uh, you know, they don't have Pride Fest this year and, uh, all, you know, all the other stuff that's not going on. So, uh, or, you know, and just general shopping and eating out and all that sort of stuff. So it's huge. There are huge implications at the state level for having um, the, the new administration in place. Um, aside from that, the war on public education, the war on science, um, you know, all that stuff is, is super relevant here in Wisconsin because we've kind of been a pressure point for a lot of those policies. And we feel a lot of it first here, um, just given kind of where we're at in national dynamics as well as the amount of money that the Koch brothers have pumped into our state um, for, for the last uh, well over a decade now. Um, so actually closer, you know, almost 20 years now, getting, getting closer to 20 years, time flies. Um, but, um, but that, that's a huge upgrade. And, and even, you know, uh, things like, um, 
yeah, anyway, th there'll be a lot of positive changes, I think, from it. But overall, uh, the biggest change is probably going to be the amount of state aid we're going to receive and the amount of help we're going to get, um, which will have significant effects on being able to keep the doors open and keeping basic services going. And it's incredibly impactful and incredibly important, especially if you're someone who uh, might be in a situation with um, um, so some additional challenges uh, you're facing um, and stuff like that. So, yeah. And, um, and again, if people want to talk more about any of these subjects, we're also happy to get emailed and have longer conversations on each one of these questions. I feel like we could have more, but uh, the next question is actually directed towards Representative Snicky and Senator Larson. So I'll let them take it. Take the lead, Chris. I'll follow up. <laughs> oh, I'm still <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, the question is, what steps should be taken to continue to ensure fair elections? Campaign finance, um, automatic voter registration, national popular vote, et cetera. Yes, all of the above. Let's do all of those. Those sound great. Um, so to that end, um, I, I did introduce um, campaign, the 2019 uh, campaign integrity package. Uh, this would increase transparency of political contributions from who uh, from who is donating, so you'd have an idea. Uh, support. I do support a national popular vote, um, given two elections in the last two decades have ended with a president who did not receive a majority of the votes. Um, I do support automatic voter registration to ensure all Wisconsinites have the opportunity to exercise their constitutional right to vote. Um, and so that is something that um, actually a lot of other states do it already. Basically any point of contact you have with the state, there's your registration is updated and that makes sense. A lot of these things are historic blockades to voting and make it that much harder, right? There's a lot more that we could be doing uh, to make sure that, that people have access to, to voting. Um, and so having same day voter registration in Wisconsin is something we all stand by and want to continue. Uh, but frankly, having the ability to register easily and be able to vote easily um, is I think the answer to, uh, uh, to making sure things work, work, work well, right? Uh, how do you fix democracy? More democracy uh, is, is the cure. Um, yeah, I, I can't argue with anything that Senator Larson said. Um, you know, Wisconsin's always been very, it's been known for um, how easy it has been to register to vote because of the same day registration. And now we've got the anti-democracy party, I guess I'd call them, looking for ways to, to curtail that. Um, so I do believe that we have to start looking at um, automatic registration. That any, like Chris said, anytime you have a contact with a state agency, you go to the DOT, whatever, the DMV, you can register to vote right there. Um, it needs to be open, it needs to be easy. Um, and it needs, you know, we need to make sure that we are reaching out to every single eligible voter. I know this last election, um, I wasn't personally involved with it, but I helped coordinate some of it. Um, there are over 23,000 new voters that we were able to register in the city of Milwaukee alone uh, in a couple of months leading, leading up to the election. Um, you know, these are voters that some were, you know, middle-aged and above that had never voted before. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I was raised that uh, you turn 18 and you vote. I've never missed an election and we need to make sure people understand that their vote is, is their voice and it's the most important right that they have. Yeah. Um, yeah, and Wisconsin historically has high turnout and so, right. but there's still more that we can do. We're still at 76% in the last election. Uh, we tend to be in the top five. We were fifth in the nation um, as far as the, the numbers go for the last, the last count. Um, sorry, I just got to tell this story quick, Chris, if I could. And it wasn't in Wisconsin. I think it was somewhere down south. Woman who was about 101 years old, never voted before, registered to vote and cast her very first vote this last election. I thought that was a really cool story. <laughs> that is awesome. That is. Mm -hmm. that. Um, all right. And uh, Representative Snicky, you've got the next one too. Oh, um, 
how do we, let's see, it was about reaching, how do we know what our representatives are doing and how do we, we keep in touch with them? I'm paraphrasing the question, but um, you know, the three of us, Senator Larson, Senator Brostoff and I have always um, been very active and um, very visible in our districts, whether it would be a some kind of festival or, you know, or a city meeting, but unfortunately, um, you know, COVID has changed that. And so we've had to find new ways to connect with with our constituents and our neighbors. So we've been doing a lot of this kind of stuff, um, you know, online stuff. But, you know, we all do have um, official Facebook accounts, official Twitter accounts that we post um, what is going on. Uh, our doors are always open to anybody. Um, I'm very, um, very reachable. And we all have staffs that are top notch. Um, so if you need to, to get in touch with any of us, all you gotta do is either pick up the phone or open your computer and, and you'll get us. So, you know, hopefully by fall, we'll be able to be back out and about actually talking to our neighbors and constituents one-on-one, -on -one, so. Awesome, yep. And uh, representative, or sorry, uh, my staffer, uh, Justin Belinsky put in the, the chat to uh, there's a link if you're, there's specific bills that you're interested in, uh, specific topics, um, um, you can check that out and, and receive updates and then also finding your contact info. So I encourage you to do that. It's the best way um, yep. uh, to be able to make sure you're on, you're on top of an issue. All right, Representative Brostoff, is, can you get the next one? Sure, so the next question we have is, and this is directed towards all of us, but I'll go first. How will you support fight against systemic racism and those affected by it? Well, first off, uh, you know, it's, I don't think there's one kind of quote unquote magic bullet policy or anything like that that's going to solve everything. Um, you know, it's, it's a huge problem and I think we have to tackle it from many areas of disparity and obvious of disparity in obviously Wisconsin, we, um, you know, first and foremost need to tackle it from the you know, economic opportunity side mm -hmm. of things and the educational side of things and from the criminal justice side of things, which are three categories that unfortunately we're leading the nation in as far as our disparities, uh, making it one of the worst places in the country to raise black children. So on the criminal justice side, I have a, you know, I have a package of bills I've been working on for a while, as well as with uh, other assembly people and senators um, that will be rolling out pretty soon. And that's a lot around criminal justice reform, uh, police reform, elimination of racist laws, um, and uh, laws that are disproportionately hurting uh, certain populations and specifically black population um, and populations of color in general. Um, but there's, you know, there has to be target investment as well. Um, you know, one thing, one way to look at it is this. We just had a story in the news about the Foxconn. Once again, uh, Representative Voss has named himself to the uh, head, you know, to the head of WEDEC, and he's going to use this position to try and squeeze as many pennies out of this horribly corrupt uh, expression of extreme corporate welfare known as the Foxconn as he can. And this is a company that may or may not have promised a bunch of campaign dollars to certain politicians that may or may not have said, oh, this is going to be a Gen 10, you know, 0.5 factory and we're going to have all this, you know, Starship Enterprise stuff and spacecrafts and, you know, woody woo and, you know, blah, blah, blah type stuff. And we're going to, you know, be the Silicon Valley of Wisconsin. They called it Wisconsin Valley or whatever, you know, the stupid name for it was. And they're going to do all this, you know, triangle of technology, da, da, da. And as myself and Representative Sinicki and Senator Larson and others pointed out right away, and I wrote an op-ed as soon as I saw the bill because it was so silly and so poorly done, as we pointed out, this was silly. But when under the current legislative leadership and under people like Representative Voss and uh, at that time Senator Fitzgerald, when they have the reins of power and Scott Walker and Donald Trump what do they do? And when it comes to, you know, funding our education so that we have an appropriate ratio of students to teachers, oh, that's too much. We can't touch that. Da, da, da. 
when it comes to giving up to, you know, $4 billion or so in corporate welfare and subsidies and payoffs to one private corporation that has terrible track record, a horrible human rights violations record, a horrible environmental record, and a really bad record for keeping their promises. Oh, it's all hands on deck and let me shell out the pockets so much so that they're even getting a downgrading in their standard from uh, Moody's uh, for the local community there, uh, Mount Pleasant. That's where money's getting spent now. Extreme corporate welfare is a huge way that public dollars are being siphoned away from the communities that need them the most into the biggest campaign donors' pockets. We should really be doing that differently and saying that there are communities that have been hurt historically that have uh, been traumatized generation after generation that need targeted economic investment. There's going to be equity in our society. And by the way, that money would get recycled directly back in and not go to some, you know, tax hate, you know, it wouldn't be escaping our economy. That would be recycled back in. So, um, so anyway, you know, I'm going to, I've fought against corporate welfare and targeted economic investment to communities that need it. I'm going to continue to do so. Um, but with the lens of equity, of course, making sure that communities of color and black communities specifically are getting um, the resources that they need, as well as, like I said, uh, educational um, opportunities, criminal justice reform, um, and, you know, you know, you know, eliminating cash bail bonds and uh, raising, you know, the, you know, public transportation access at it all. It's an ecosystem that all plays into each other. And you can't, you know, it's like a spider web. You have to, you know, if you're touching one aspect of it, it's affecting everything. So you need to take a holistic approach. Um, but uh, I was, you know, obviously, you know, heavily involved, you know, as far as civil rights marches going on this summer and stuff like that. But I plan to, now that session has started, continue that work uh, legislatively as well. Oh, right. I mean, just to add, uh... Just to add to that, um, it's I think it's it is key that we do reform uh, our current system, and um, just having conversations today about what we can do to try to be able to do that. Um, and um, I, you know, Representative Brostov kind of touched on this that there is a disingenuous effort to try and address systemic racism and those affected by it, and that came out today uh, that there was that there was a task force that had every intention of just grounding any. Uh, progress on this, and so it is. It is. While it's not surprising, it is frustrating uh, that that this is not being taken up in a genuine way. Um, but we're trying to we're trying to push for that. Um, try and reach out to uh, neighbors, family, and friends about these tough conversations. Make sure that social progress is uh, is happening, um, and making sure that we've that we're we're pushing for those reforms. So while we might not be able to pass policy. Uh, the, the dialogue is changing and there's a recognition, right? Um, if you read between the lines of these, these emails that came out through this open records request, there was a blunt recognition that they need, at least need to talk about it, uh, which, which, you know, while it's frustrating, they didn't, they didn't, they're not pushing any legislation, they're not going to act on it, uh, or they weren't planning to, maybe that changes now that the public knows their game um, and that this is their, their bread and butter hustle. Uh, but the fact that they they realized they had to at least show that they were they cared about it is progress. Um, now it's time to actually get progress and actually get some bills passed uh, because because the gig is up and the hustle is up. Um, so we'll we we'll be keep pushing for that. Um, next one is is back to uh, oh uh, sorry Representative Sinicki on uh, systemic racism and those affected by it. Um, thank you, Senator. Um, you know, I think I've always said you can't legislate common sense. You can't legislate uh, good behavior. Um, but what we can do is legislate support for those who are, are being treated uh, inequitably. You know, there was a case, was it yesterday? Uh, Sun Prairie School District where uh, the teachers had a question about slavery. Um, you know, we actually have policies against that, <laughs> teaching that kind of stuff, but yet 
it's being done and um, they're not going to get away with it. But I do think, you know, if we're going to stop systemic racism, it needs, it needs to start also in our communities, like Sarah Larson said. We need to talk to our relatives, our friends, our neighbors, and even those who we don't agree with. Um, you know, interesting conversation today with another one of my colleagues, um, African-American. This has been going on since the 1600s. It's got to stop. This is 2021. And this, to me, that we are still asking these same questions and still dealing with these same issues is just unconscionable. And um, this is where the community's got to come together, no matter what side of of the political aisle you're on. And uh, but like Sarah Larson said, we saw what the Republicans have done with the um, task force, and they they made pretty much a joke of it. Um, they used it for political gain and they have no intention of doing anything with it. So it's time that we take this into our own hands and really push these policies that are going to change people's hearts and minds. I'm Indeed. done with my soapbox. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> nice. Um, and I, again, just to, to comment, we do have, uh, I know a couple of comments, a couple of questions are coming in in the chat and on the Q&A section, which is, which is great. Um, if, if we can, we can, we, we can take a look at those. But for the deeper ones, um, like Aldine uh, asked, uh, we'll need a little bit more time. So just make sure to, to either email it or, or give us your contact info so we can get back to you. Uh, not that we're trying to ignore it. We just want to make sure we're giving out accurate information. Otherwise, we'll give. <laughs> otherwise, we'll, we'll have to give the, the default answer of like that's great. We'll have to look at it and and come back to you. Um, so, um, so the next two are to Representative Rostov. Yeah, and I um, just want to take a quick break and make sure our interpreters are okay. Do we need to switch curves? We're good right now. Okay. All right, uh, thanks. And um, the next question, let's see, go back to document. Uh, do you support the reallocation of police funding towards social service programs? Yes, absolutely, uh, without hesitation. Uh, and it's better for everyone. Police are not trained, certified mental health experts. And to ask them to do that sort of work is not only dangerous and inefficient, it's also an inappropriate burden to place on them. They're not social workers. They're, you know, they, they should be doing things other than that sort of work. And we've obviously seen successful models such as CAHOOTS out in Eugene, Oregon, um, as well as, um, you know, there's, you know, PICS, there's other uh, programs across the country, but I, you know, what's going on in Denver, you know, it's kind of exciting, especially given the, you know, the data that they've come up with now um, from their, their work on it. But yes, I mean, it doesn't make sense. And part of what's happened is that for years and years, for decades, we've seen a slow decline in access and resources being driven for social service agencies in this country. And, you know, police's budgets are ballooning, you know, continue to expand and get bigger and bigger. And so they're being asked to do a lot more on the back end of work that should be handled on the front end. And I mean, a great example, unfortunately, is we just saw a nine-year-old girl. And if you haven't seen the video, I do not recommend it. It's horrible and very, you know, terrible to see. I literally got physically ill, you know, personally after watching it. Um, but there was a girl who was nine years old who was in need of help that the police, you know, there's six or so, you know, cops who came upon her out there in Rochester, New York. Um, and, you know, instead of, you know, and, and as someone who's worked in homeless, who's worked in youth homeless shelters and who's worked in social service agencies myself for, you know, for almost two decades, it's very, you know, first off, just common sense should tell you not to behave that way, but it's very obvious not to behave in the manner that they behaved in, um, you know, and, you know, anyway, and, and, and the standards for that profession and, and that sort of behavior are completely out of control. In other words, if a school teacher would be on camera treating a, a nine-year-old kid like that who's handcuffed, whose, you know, face is in the snow, 
you know, in, four, in 14 degree weather. And if a, you know, it's youth worker was videotaped, if a parent was videotaped doing that, you would call child protective services and take that kid away. And for law enforcement agents who are, you know, who are supposed to be the people who are the ones that are supposed to be safety in like their program. And, you know, if you have someone who's in need and, you know, they're supposed to be helpers and stuff like that or whatever, to treat a nine-year-old child in that fashion after, you know, they're upset she's not complying, she's asking for her dad, she's behaving like a child, she's asking for her dad, she's asking for a guardian. So again, as someone who's done a lot of youth work and has worked at homeless shelters and who's, been, and who's seen a lot of traumatic situations, by the way, before as a legislator, I, a legislator, I can tell you, I've seen, you know, very extreme situations and stuff like that or whatever with kids who didn't deserve any sort of, the, you know, violence that they saw visit upon them and nothing like that and horrible situations. And that's no excuse for behaving like that towards someone else. In fact, that should soften your heart and make you want to help people more, not hurt them. So that was a pretty extreme example, but unfortunately that happens every single day in this country where there are interactions that are wildly inappropriate for the police to be engaged in. And that even aside from my own moral qualms about their personal behavior, they, they shouldn't be doing in the first place. They, 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 you know, focus on getting those clearance rates up and those conviction rates for violent crimes. You know, that's what they should be doing. They shouldn't be engaged in, um, you know, I uh, heard, you know, so, you know, that you, you have professionals who have mental health backgrounds or have youth work backgrounds who are experts in DSA, who know this stuff, and we should be redirecting resources towards them. And by the way, that's the other thing. That's the other side of it. You know what makes us unsafe? You know why we've had to cut all these other agencies? Because we have mandatory overtime, because we have mandatory payments for police brutality, and that costs the city of Milwaukee, for example, around $500,000 every single year for over the last 20 years, we have, and that's, and that's not, a, you know, and it might even be well more than that. We have, you know, these pensions that are polluted, you know, we, we have this incredible cost that is taken, you know, about 50% of the city's budget. So yes, there has that, then that's mandatory spending. So there has to be cuts elsewhere. Instead of that, we could be much, even if you don't care, you know, there's some of my colleagues who are much more about the dollars and cents and morality of it or whatever. And even if you don't give a damn about the morality or, you know, treatment of people who are in crisis situations need help or are just in need of some help or whatever, even fiscally, it's more responsible and more appropriate. So it's a long answer. It's something I feel very strongly about quite, you know, quite frankly on a personal level. But yes, the answer is yes, absolutely. We should absolutely be putting resources in a more effective manner towards treatment, towards solutions, towards mental health care, and away from the violence of policing. And I think sorry, when I mute, I think Senator Larson is next to take the question. Yeah, thank you, Representative uh, Representative Brownstuff. Uh, the next one is, do you support a body cam requirement for police officers? Yes. Um, we're at that point in technology where it makes sense to have those on. And that was part of, part of a um, uh, uh, special research committee that uh, talked about requiring and, and, and writing a statewide policy on body cameras. Unfortunately, it came out with the most milk toast recommendations and ended up voting against it. Uh, these study committees usually pass unanimous um, bills, uh, but basically all they did is they came up with guideline legislation. If a local municipality wants to have um, uh, legislation or wants to have requirements around body cameras, we said, here's what you could do, um, which is frustrating because the state is supposed to, the legislature is supposed to make the laws. Uh, so just putting soft requirements in simply did not meet the moment. Um, so I was the, the solo no on that one. Um, so our, our citizens deserve that. They, they deserve police accountability, um, especially when the, the, um, the power to use force against citizens is given to a unit of the government. There, there damn well better be a lot of accountability that goes along with that to make sure that it is not abused. 
and that when that force is used, it is um, backed up in the law. Um, and that is something that that you know I believe very strongly, and that is that goes to the nature of what uh, policing is and how we're going to change that behavior. Um, and further, if you look at other other communities that are further out ahead of us and what body cameras constantly being on and being on officers does, uh, it it makes it it reduces the use of force overall. Um, and it also it, and that comes from both uh, police and it also uh, has a calming effect on the public. Um, I think there's we're at the point right now where I think a lot of people assume that there are cameras all over the place. Um, this this would ma mandate um, that those cameras are rolling, and uh, and frankly that that information is publicly accessible uh, to a degree, and uh, and that uh, there is accountability that's associated with it. Uh, jump to the next. Jump into the next question. Are you in favor of legalizing recreational marijuana? Uh, I'll start. Yes, hundred um, percent. For so many different reasons, and I'll, I'll, um, yeah, I'll let my colleagues um, take a swing at that one too. That's I've authored the bill, so I'm not. It's not just something that's a, a trivia question of if we do this. Yes, I'm the uh, main sponsor, one of the main sponsors of of a few uh, in the Senate um, for medical, for recreational, and for decriminalization. Yeah, I'm. I have co-authored every bill that's come around. Um, on both medical and recreational. It makes no sense to me. Um, if you look at other states that have already moved in that direction, um, I mean, they're making some, some, some good money on it and able to fill potholes and fund education. Um, you know, you, you legalize it, you regulate, you tax it, and hey, <laughs> we could pay for a lot of services that way. Yeah, I'm in complete agreement, and I've always been supportive of it since when I first ran. It was an issue I ran on, even um, at that time, it was as popular um, uh, from from my race's perspective. But yeah, I, I think it's it's uh, and and it also is a big racial justice issue, given not just the racist nature of why marijuana was being, you know, why cannabis was made illegal, why it's even called marijuana, but also. Um, you know how it's been implemented and how for example white kids and black or white people and black people have about the same usage rate but the arrest rates are uh, more than double uh well more than double actually and in some cases up to four times as much um for uh the black counterparts even though like i said usage rates are nearly the same so um yeah for sure uh yeah without hesitation um and then let's see, the next question is, do you, do you support increased education requirements for police officers post-secondary degree? Um, I think that there needs to, so it's a long question and longer than we have time for, but I've been doing a lot of research on this very subject. Uh, actually, and what I think Wisconsin needs right now would be a standardized training program used uh, statewide with more transparency and civilian uh, oversight. Um, and making sure that uh, the grants going to uh, additional and supplementary educational uh, resources, such as the you know bulletproof David uh, Grossman work or the uh, killology stuff, is absolutely positively not allowed and banned. Um, and making sure that uh, there's there's more, you know, the long story, the long and short of it is there's kind of been. In the history of policing in this country, uh, since the first official police started, um, there's kind of like two general schools of thought on the spectrum and then people lie in the middle. The kind of skull cracking, we just have to beat up the bad guys or go beat up unions. Actually, a lot of us beating up union members and we have to like kind of, you know, be very violent, crack skulls and be, you know, more on that side. And then there's another side which is no, we should be using evidence and crime labs and we should be doing fingerprints and doing more investigation and detective side of things and there needs to be more education involved. And um, there's, and then there's kind of the, there's, there's kind of this tug and pull that's gone on over the years with the different guidebooks and philosophies and uh, thought leaders within the policing communities. Um, and I think that the more, what's known as the professionalization model and the more education um, has more benefits than going the other route, but I think it's much more complicated than that. And we also have to look at 
exactly what type of education we're talking about. And that's where the rubber meets the road. Um, so yes, more education if it's the right education. And we need to be diligent about that as well as have more civilian oversight. Sorry, and kicking up to the next, we have uh, um, Representative Sinicki for our next question, number 13 on there. Chris. Or I'll go and then she can go after me. The next question is, how has COVID and recent events concerning police change police policies you're thinking regarding them? Well, um, COVID is the number one killer of cops by far this year, uh, not close. It's more, this last year, it's bigger than, it, you know, all the other factors combined, there are more cops that died of COVID than everything else combined. So it's had a huge effect in that regard, as well as, uh, you know, there was for a long time, um, nationally as well as in Wisconsin, a huge hesitancy to wear masks. Um, and that's changing, I think, culturally, but that's a whole nother issue. Um, but my views haven't changed. I think I've been pushing for police reform since day one. And I think the system's uh, dangerously, you know, I think the system's dangerous and broken in many ways. And I feel terrible for the lives lost to COVID and, and from that regard, but um, it hasn't really changed my perspective. Uh, um, so yeah, uh, and then Representative Snicky, um, Yeah. Yep, go ahead. And honestly, um, I would really like to talk to whoever uh, submitted this question because I'm not quite sure what what you're looking for on this. Um, I don't, I'm kind of baffled as to the question. Um, I mean, COVID has affected everybody's lives, including police and firemen and teachers and, and myself. So I'm not quite sure uh, the connection between COVID and police on this one. So whoever asked this question, if you want to reach out to me, I would love to talk to you. Great, and uh, oh. uh, I don't know how much, I know that uh, Nick is, this Nick who's uh, staffing is giving us a text, so it's like a lot of these guys. Oh, sorry, environment's the next question, sorry. Uh, do you support active waste recycling program, waste reduction program? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, and although recycling is an essential tool in, in fighting waste, it's not, not nearly enough. And I think we need to uh, kind of be working on the front end a little bit as well, um, as well as you know things like the right to repair um, laws that we should be uh, pushing in Wisconsin. Um, and you know, there's, I mean, we have a huge issue with bulky and excessive packaging um, that prioritizes convenience over the environment. Um, you know, the, so yes, but I don't think it's just about recycling. Uh, and I know we're short on time, so it's all the same. And uh, Representative Sinicki, it looks like you got the next question. Uh, uh, it is, do you support government initiatives for the proliferation of renewable energy generation? Um, absolutely. Um, I think we we really need to uh, start looking at what we're going to leave to our grandchildren, great grandchildren. Um, we should have been looking at this a long, long time ago, and it looks like we finally are starting to address it um, in some areas. I know Align Energy has already said they're shutting down one of their plants, their coal plants, and I think mm -hmm. we Energies is, is looking at something. So that's a step in the right direction, but we have a long way to go. Right. And a lot of the, a lot of these companies are doing this uh, on their own, which is fantastic. Right. This yep. is the public pressure. This isn't uh, government mandates. This is this is that there are um, frankly, there's mandates happening in other states and the pressure is, is uh, shifting over to Wisconsin, which is great. And I think um, Ford said they're actually going to stop making gas powered cars. Uh, GM. GM. Yep. OK. Yeah. 15 yeah, GM, years GM, which is which is good right now. GM makes one electric vehicle, so I think they were feeling the pressure. Some of it's politics, but but frankly, you know, it's great. You know, if they actually do it by uh, shifting their entire fleet of of what they're selling by uh, 2040 to all electric. So others others are feeling that pressure. So it's good, and obviously that helps the that helps the planet. Um, at the last projection, say we've got nine years uh, before stuff really gets bad and really gets irreversible. So uh, hopefully the uh, Federal administration is able to pass the uh, $2 trillion uh, bill that they were talking about 
all throughout the campaign to address uh, man-made climate change. Um, I, I could, we could talk about that all night. Um, but we, as Nick says, we're running out of time. Um, so the, the question that I've got um, is speaking of the environment is on pollution. And the question specifically is, are you concerned about the level of pollution present in Wisconsin groundwater or methane levels generated by dairy farming? Um, it's, it's not specifically dairy farming that, that uh, worries me, but yes, I do worry about our water. Um, I worry about PFAS contamination, um, which is a huge issue. There was PFAS used in firefighting foam at our airport, and so there was contamination in the water. Um, that has not been uh, fully addressed or remedied, um, and we are continuing to try and push at the state level. There was a really uh, milk toast, uh, I guess, watered down, for lack of a better term, uh, watered down bill that deals with, with PFAS in water. Um, bill that passed last session. And not only was it not adequate, it was like the bare minimum. Um, it was basically said that don't, don't, if you still don't manufacture new stuff, but if you have stuff, you can use it for a few more years. And the liability was, was not direct. Even, even that they ended up um, coming back and, and extinguishing through the rulemaking process. So it's not even being enacted. Uh, governor responded with, a, with a, uh, an order um, to do more around PFAS contamination. So that concerns me. Um, the um, uh, CAFOs, the condensed animal feeding operations in the state uh, and their runoff, um, that, that is very concerning and what that's doing to our waterways, uh, especially not even to mention what that does to our local family run farms um, of how that consolidation is hurting. Um, and lead contamination, which has not been met with the need that it, it requires at the state level. It's been nibbling around the edges. Um, so yes, very concerned. Um, and, and we've, I've, I've authored bills and continue to try and push for to, to happen around that specifically on PFAS. We, we fought back uh, tooth and nail on the, on the effort to, to, to refuse to do any remediation or to do anything, not remediation, but to acknowledge the problem and make sure that those that are using it are held accountable. Um, jumping to the next question, transportation or the next section, uh, transportation. Um, do, 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 I'm just making sure. We're good. Oh, we switched. Okay, we're good. Okay, thank you. Um, Question, transportation, do you support the creation of mass transit and public transportation systems over the expansion of existing highway freeway systems? Um, in general, yeah. Uh, over the last past decade, Wisconsin has proven uh, we are pretty highway obsessed. That's where most of the, the state um, transportation funds are going is to huge mega expansions of our freeways. So uh, we spent millions and millions remodeling and expanding freeways while local roads and public transit is left to languish in, in disrepair. Um, we had a survey question. I don't know if we're gonna have time to go to all of it, uh, but 87.9% of respondents think that we should be prioritizing local roads and public transit, transit over highway expansion, while just 9.9% think we should prioritize highways. So that unfortunately does not match what is happening in the state. Um, and so just to, to, to nail it down, the plan I-94 project uh, has become highly controversial in part because this tremendous expenditure primarily benefits people outside Milwaukee who are zipping through Milwaukee, uh, while our bus system, bridges, local streets that are in desperate need of repair and upgrades uh, will not be benefited by this uh, to a great degree. And so most of the comments that we've gotten, that I've gotten, and the people pushing DOT are against this huge mega expansion that'll cost millions of dollars. Uh, frankly, as much as people wanna speed through on the freeway, um, with all the twists and turns and, and the way that the exits are constructed, it makes sense to continue to have the 50 mile an hour speed limit through the city um, so that we have less accidents. So expanding the roads does not necessarily mean things will speed up and it's the opposite is true. Um, so that's where we stand on that. And Boaz is, yes, is Hi, Boaz. in heated agreement here. <laughs> I got a special the, guest joining conversation us today. Like, <laughs> this uh, trying to delay his bath time a little bit. So. 
just wanted to say hi to everyone before. Thank you. So. <laughs> Jonathan, should we skip um, you for a second or do you want to address yeah, transportation? I can jump on transportation while we wait for him to. Um, I just want to, you know, talk about a bit about um, what happened a number of years ago with the RTAs, um, regional transit authorities, is something that um, we actually need in order to put some of our mass transportation ideas to make them real. Um, if you all recall, I mean, there was talk of a commuter train um, from Kenosha we're seen up to Milwaukee, it's supposed to kind of come through Bayview, St. Francis, Cudahy. St. Francis and Cudahy had really um, centered their um, economic development plan around this train coming through and making stops. But of course, um, the majority party, um, for some reason, does not like or believe in RTAs. And uh, they repealed all the RTA policies and laws. So it's something that we have to keep pushing in order to get the funding um, and the support we need to actually build that public transportation public transportation system. Because I think we all know that in an area like this or any area, um, you know that in you know we 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 depend a lot on tourism dollars in Milwaukee on the South Shore in the, in the summertime. And a lot of people are gonna look at, at public transportation and we don't have a truly effective pub, uh, public transportation system. So we need to push those RTAs again. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Uh, I guess we're talking transportation. I'm oh, sorry, my, uh, I got a quick distraction, but um, yeah, RTA is absolutely multimodal transit in general and you know, unfortunately, the U.S. lags behind so much of the world on public transportation issues, and in Wisconsin specifically, um, it's incredibly important for community development. It's great return on investment. It's really good for local businesses because having like fixed rail systems as well, uh, you know, as as buses helps no let business know people are going to be coming and going. Um, subverts, you know, it supports diverse employment. Um, it's good for people with disabilities and helps with independence. Uh, you know, affordable commuting options are incredibly valuable to uh, society and it's better for the environment. Uh, so yes, 100% uh, agreed and um, I appreciate the question. And next uh, we got uh, another one on, the, or is this one we just did? Do you support a hop extension? Was that, no, okay, um, I do. Oh. Again, I think, you know, supporting multimodal and transit uh, options, yes. So I will say yes, I support multimodal transit expansion. Um, yeah, I, I also support the expansion of public transit, but the, just to be clear, this is a state, this is a local issue that there, there are no state dollars for the hop. Just to speak up for doing radio, um, that there are no state dollars in fact, in fact, a lot of local funding, or sorry, local organizations. Uh, I think most recently was uh, Potawatomi was pushing that. Um, I'm getting the signal to push through to the end, but I do, I, I want to, if, if folks will stick around, I want to make sure we hit unemployment insurance because there has been a lot of, I mean, that has been the number one issue that we've received questions on from my office. Um, so if we can hit the UI questions, I know a lot of people are, are interested in that. Um, so Representative Sinicki, if you can you yep, can kick we'll it try and get through these quick, yeah. Yep, yep. Uh, why is the UI process so difficult and how could it be changed to better assist constituents in the future? There's a couple of reasons why it's so difficult. Uh, number one being over the past 10 years, um, there have been some changes made to our UI laws that have made it extremely difficult to get it. Um, you know, regarding how many, how, how long you've worked. Um, they went on kind of what I wanted to call witch hunts. Um, they created all kinds of, of categories that were fraud. Um, they will try to find any reason to uh, stop you can, from, from getting your, your UI. And how do we fix it? One of the major problems that we found, especially since COVID um, and our system got so overwhelmed and it's, it's true, um, our system, our mainframe is 50 years old and cannot handle the current um, UI programs. A lot of those UI uh, 
a lot of the applications had to be um, physically hand read and hand done. Uh, they were not digitalized because of the federal government uh, mandates that you actually um, um, read those. They actually have paper copies of it, which is hard to believe in this day and age. So, um, you know, we are looking at, the governor is proposing to put the money into um, upgrading everything in the UI system. So we will be ready if this ever happens again. Hopefully it won't. Yeah, I mean, it's a, um, yeah, it's a, it's a persistent issue. And uh, the, the next question is, how will you assist those unfair, unfairly affected by complicated UI processes? And uh, in addition to trying to change the, the process back, so there are just, there are, un, the unnecessary speed bumps are removed. Uh, those things that just flag so many people um, that, that would otherwise not be flagged uh, for, for potential fraud. Yes, we want to address fraud, but the reality is um, some of the things that, that have led to years long bans um, and being able to receive unemployment insurance are misanswering or answering uh, a question uh, incorrectly that is, is written in a confusing way, right? And they, they, they basically say, okay, we're just gonna identify a lot of that as fraud. And that has thrown up so many different flags. Um, and there's a lot of local press uh, that, have, that have done a good job of, of covering that. So, um, but yeah, in addition to authoring uh, UI reform bills with my democratic colleagues in July of last year, my office, <clears throat> we've been working to address each constituent claim as it comes in. <clears throat> So we're doing that and uh, there's, there's um, a change in the process, but we're continuing to work in communication with Department of Workforce Development about the, the troubles neighbors are having. Um, so big thank you to my staff who are, who are still on this, uh, this call, Nick Janice, Justin Blinsky and Justin Sargent and our interns who have been doing an amazing job of handling those, um, making sure people are, are guided through uh, to be able to get the employment benefits that they deserve. All right, I feel like that's, we feel like I know Representative Siniki and I hit, hit the kind of the answer for the last one, Jonathan. Um, so we'll, we'll do our, uh, do you wanna kick off the, the goodbyes? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. The, the UI one is, is also a longer conversation. So if anyone wants to talk offline, feel free to hit me up. But yeah, I mean, you know, it's a really challenging time for a multitude of reasons for everyone. And that does not exclude legislators. And it gets even more challenging when you have our colleagues in the majority party who are saying things like masks are evil. Uh, that's a quote, um, you, you know, who are saying uh, there's all this QAnon conspiracy stuff that they're pushing um, so they can have more voter suppression legislation down the line. Um, and I get a lot of I, I'm very refreshed and it helps me to hear directly from you all and the conversations we have. And, you know, I, I obviously um, I'm doing that much more over the phone now. Normally I'd be able to meet more people in person and sit down for coffee with my constituents. But, um, but I just want to say, I really appreciate you all and I appreciate my colleagues and it can be a challenging job at times, but it gives a lot of strength to know what it's all about. And that's, that's because of you. So thank you. And again, thanks so much to the staff who helped make this happen and as well as to our wonderful interpreting staff with Lisa and uh, Tamara. And um, thanks to everyone for participating and I'll uh, kick it to Representative Nikki next. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Um, yeah, mm. first of all, thank you all for, for uh, joining us here tonight and also for, for really being patient, you know, this past year, it's, it's been a rough year. And I want to quickly before I pass it on to Sergeant Larson, um, just want to clarify one thing I said about, about uh, UI. Um, you know, under the new administration, the Evers administration, they have been working hard to make sure that people are getting their UI. Um, so I don't want anybody to misinterpret what I said there. Um, and I know all the legislators that I know of have been working really hard with our constituents uh, trying to get them the services they need. So I wanted to clarify that. But other than that, just thank you so much. Um, you know, if you you can always reach out to me, um, I will have. I think my staff is on the line. I will have 
contact information into the chat. Um, yeah, feel free anytime my door is open. I, and I look forward to hearing from you and hopefully sometime before this end of summer actually seeing you. So have a good night. Yep. Um, and just to, to, to give my final farewell, thank you to everybody who tuned in tonight and spent the third, what the night is it? Wednesday, Wednesday night with us um, when you had a lot of other options. So I, I appreciate you guys being civically engaged and taking the time to uh, ask questions, uh, follow up, and to be able to um, uh, listen to us for the last hour and a half. So appreciate that. And just to reiterate, um, we do, if, if you have other questions and we didn't get to it, please uh, contact our offices directly. And we'll, uh, you know, we'll do our best to make sure we're following up with you. Um, we didn't get a chance to get to the survey responses, uh, which is a bummer because we did compile those. We put them into charts about where people stand. Um, if if uh, on everything from um, transportation funding to marijuana legalization, decriminalization, uh, and more. So you can check those results where, you know, see if you stand in the same position as your uh, your neighbors on these issues. So I encourage you to, to check that out. The link is over in the chat. Um, so that is it. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll do our best to make sure you're, uh, you're informed and well represented. So stay safe, stay warm, and uh, hopefully we don't get a ton more snow uh, for shoveling. <laughs>